to Facebook and check that things are working. Can we keep the chat on? Is that, can you keep the chat on? No, I'm just wondering if... Live. Yeah. Is it up? Yeah, I can see us. Oh, okay. A bit slower on my end. Ah, okay, there we are. So then I bring us up so I can pay attention to the comment section and turn off past us and check who's there. Okay, so I think... Okay, and Sai. Yeah, there's Sai. Okay, Sai's in the comment section. Okay, so um, I will do proper introductions in a minute, but what we tend to do is, yeah, we just wait for um, people to turn up um, and then we will do an intro, otherwise I have to repeat it again. So everyone can just say hi to Steve. Hey, Steve. <laughs> Did somebody make that for you? Yeah, um, Amy, Amy Goldring on, oh, on the page. Is she the one that made the little Bernie as well? For... Yes. Yeah. Yeah, um, and he unpops and then he unrolls. Oh, that's awesome. oh, my daughter would love that. That's Steve. <laughs> um, okay, lovely. So we've got Jessica, Bobby, Kimberly, Laurel. Hello, people. Lovely. So I'll do a quick introduction, at least, of, of who we are and what the page is itself. Oh, now I need to bring up your bios because you're all very interesting people. Mm -hmm. um, with all your things. Okay, so for anyone who is new to the page, um, we are, or I am, <laughs> Orcademy, and um, I'm Dr. Chloe Faraha, where Orcademy is an educative platform where we talk about anything relating to autistic experience um, as taught only by autistic people. Um, and when we say educators of any background, if you're autistic and you have a topic of interest for our learners, you are welcome to be an educator and come and discuss things um, and today it's very impromptu um, the lovely three people you can see on the screen at the moment we were having a chat yesterday and I was kind of like this is an interesting chat what are people doing tomorrow do you fancy coming and talking about it um, and I don't know how but we got on to talking about neurodivergent relationships of all descriptions not just romantic um, and so we thought, I thought, okay, let's see if this will be um, something people would like to hear about. And I think, I think people do. Um, so yeah, today's is neurodivergent relationships um, and what that means and how we manage them and our perspectives as autistic people on the screen. And so I am joined by Tanya Adkin. Yeah, hi. <laughs> who is a SEND advocate and you are late identified autistic with attention differences, possibly PDA and single parent to two autistic PDA and ADHD children. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and your page, because we've, I've popped the page on there as well. So yeah. So SEND you can family. find, yeah. So we're SEND family instincts. We kind of didn't like the special educational needs thing. So we kind of recoined it, supporting education and nurturing difference. And there's me and Jess Kane, and we are both autistic ADHD adults um, who are massively involved in, well, it's law, it's, it's justice. So that, that's kind of our thing, really, supporting parents to get the help that their kids need in school. And that's going to be, hopefully, another topic we can cover in the future, because yes. I don't actually know very much at all about the... Um, education system for children and or ehcps and things so yeah. hearing from you yesterday was actually quite uh, eye-opening it's, it's um, a mess basically <laughs> but we'll cover that on a different day and i'm going to keep saying it wrong because i'm so bad at pronunciation i'm so sorry <sighs> can you say it for me so i don't mess it up okay it's it's jan with jan. The jill, like in pleasure I know, but I don't know why I can't get it to stick in my head. I've done, I've seriously, I've been practicing and I still don't can't worry. get it. I've spent my whole life having Jeannie. I had a teacher in school called me Jeannie every day for six years. Hey -ho. Okay, so Jeanne, yay, 
has spent many years in education as an educator. Now, this is all very interesting with bio. Um, you also have been an unplanned or had an unplanned interlude as a diplomat and been involved in social development work, including helping to set up and develop um, supported accommodation service for young asylum seekers. And your next project, when COVID allows, is working on coral reef restoration and sustainable livelihoods in Madagascar. Yep, there's a beach waiting for me and my husband. Um, he is a diving instructor. We both dive and I've been involved in development work for many years. So that's the next adventure. It's very interesting. Mm. Um, and clearly um, you thrive on variety um, and adventure. Um, whereas I'm like, I'm quite happy not leaving my house. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, and then lastly, but not least, we have Alice Conroy who is a neurodivergent mother, and you have multiple hats as well. So your CEO, is that thinker in pictures, as in you're like me, you think in pictures. Okay, yeah. love it. Ultra rule breaker. Yeah. And so, yes, um, your founder and CEO on, with over two decades of successful social purpose business working across the Southeast. Um, so is that how you also do you do things or have done things with Jeanne then because of yeah. your work with asylum seekers? Yeah, yeah, that's how that, that's we go back 20 years mm -hmm. of doing that as well, yeah. across that time. Wow. Um, social entrepreneur, pioneer and business leader. You can see the attention differences again. I can see when somebody's got all these things and I'm just like, I've just got my one thing. That's it. I'm just the autistic, just the one thing. Um, well, you do that one thing very, very well. <laughs> um, you are very highly imaginative, I agree. A uh, creative thinker and innovator, uh, neurodiversity advocate, cat lover, tea drinker, yeah. which I'm definitely not, rule breaker, thinker of, in pictures again, and storyteller, lovely, and proud mum, definitely, um, lovely. Oh, hold on, somebody's just asking, is there a way to see the comments and the live at the same time? Right now, they are appearing below the speakers. Um, oh, okay, so I thank you, yeah, if you can... Um, support that person to try and help them with that that would be great okay we've got a lovely lovely number 46 which i think is lovely for our um, number of learners and so i guess we can kind of jump right in can anyone think how we got around to discussing yesterday this topic of relationships i can't think how we got there i can't, I can't actually well, I think it's because we're all attending a meeting and we were talking about how um, we're neurodivergent are going to overpower the meeting with their communication. I still don't know sense, how that it? got us on to I have no this idea. idea of, because we started discussing the differences in relationships. Um, mm. And I think largely we were talking about sort of romantic relationships. Um, mm. But I think we can also discuss today a bit on platonic relationships are like friendships and the differences as well um so if i go to so i've already done bios but usually our first question is who are you what do you do and when did you discover you were autistic or otherwise neurodivergent um i won't pick on anyone is anyone happy to go first? i'll do it okay so i've already said my name's tanya i've already said what i do i'm 35 i was late discovered at about age 30 so i'm just coming into my fifth year i've kind of only just started to it takes a while doesn't it for it to all fall into place so i've kind of just got to that comfortable getting to that comfortable zone as well but um yeah that that's me <laughs> was there anything else did i forget <laughs> Um, that was really quick so um yeah so it was like who are you what do you do uh, and when did you discover you're autistic yeah so pretty much yeah know, so whole, yeah same yeah. stories a lot of um a lot of you know to, uh, women who have children that are, that are discovered and you start researching and then all of a sudden the light bulb goes I'm sure that many people have that same story Except yeah you should, do, you should do a whole live on it Chloe and you know just following Tanya say you know exactly the same I mean I'm 47 now, I lived 46 years as a neurotypical, the word autism, autistic, hadn't even entered the vocabulary at all. And so same story out of my daughter's late diagnosis, age 10, um, mine came and, you know, I've gone on this whole, so I'm quite new in, um, Tanya's had five years, Chloe about the same. About maybe? the same, yeah. Yeah, about the same. So I'm quite, you know, I'm quite a newbie. Um, to this but yeah the kind of the learning and the I mean hate the word journey but 
the path that I've been on the last year and a half. And you look back and you think, wow, you know, um, I think something for, for me that was maybe the same for you, Tanya, that is quite unusual, I understand, is that uh, my diagnosis came as a kind of a positive thing. So yeah. I wasn't diagnosed because, there were, you know, there had been problems or issues or anything like that. It was very much kind of a bit of a curiosity, actually, because obviously my daughter was on a pathway and I thought, am I, am I not? Um, and I explored it and actually, you know, explored the kind of the notion that I might be autistic and came, came away with attention differences as well. Um, but yeah, so similar, similar to Tanya. Yeah. And that then I find interesting as well, because I don't have children. Um, 37 in a couple of weeks. <laughs> and um, you weren't meant to hear that one. Um, and I only realised why did I realise? I didn't, you know, my partner's autistic with attention differences and I knew that going into the relationship and I still hadn't twigged that I was neurodivergent until about a year in. Um, and that was just because I happened to see some TED Talks on female autistics mm. um, and then just started looking into it. So it's a interesting other, yeah, like I say, a large number of late discovered autistic people will be, not always, but because of their children potentially, um, and things like that. Um, and what about you, Jan? Um, so I, I don't have any kind of diagnosis. Um, I, I don't know quite how to describe myself. Um, I've been described as lots of things over my life. Uh, unconventional seems to be a word that crops up a lot. Um, I'm half French and in France I pass for a bit of a crazy lady because I do things differently to the way things work there. Not so much in the UK. Um, I've always grown up in very diverse, very kind of open-minded communities where lots of people are very different. Um, but I've always found myself kind of feeling comfortable with and actually as an educator, you know, for the last probably 10 years or so, I've self-taught around various special educational needs and put a lot of work into supporting kids that had needs that clearly hadn't been recognized, had skills that, you know, there was one guy, bless him, very dyslexic. He still hasn't had an official, but incredibly dyslexic. And I, I arrived at this school and they said, oh, this kid, you know, I think we might have to put him down a year. And after a week, I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> no, he just can't spell, right? That's it. I mean, you know, he is and actually ended up with the top mark at the end of the year. We did a lot of work together. And so it's something that Your I recognize. Yeah, I guess I recognize, um, do you know, I was thinking about it this morning. Um, one of my earliest memories is sitting in front of a mirror and teaching myself to smile. <laughs> <laughs> because other people were doing that a lot. And I was a really serious little kid. I was like, in a book all the time and I noticed that other people did a lot of running around and smiling so I, I actually remember sitting in the mirror and going, um, so I'm just knows? wondering had anybody before I very autistically went you're not neurotypical <laughs> yesterday when I met you for the first first time I haven't mm -hmm. met you before have I no mm -hmm. um so had anyone ever said anything in relation to being autistic or neurodivergent in some capacity no no like I said I've had I've had different a lot but but nothing nothing more kind of specific than that um and it's it's not been a problem most of the time you know it hasn't sort of raised barriers for me I've managed to kind of do things my way and and that works somehow so and I yeah. think that's also interesting because going back to what Alice said which is getting the diagnosis was actually a positive thing um, and we talk a lot on Academy about how, well, my hope is that we should be moving away from diagnosing altogether anyway, because I think it should be discovery um, and seeing it that it happens that you discover you're autistic the way you will discover your sexuality, for instance, mm -hmm. who you're attracted to, you know, your personality, all this kind of thing um, in a much more holistic and hopefully more positive way, because otherwise you're tying that negative if you're going through a negative point in your life or you're really struggling, then you tie the diagnosis and blame autism, um, mm. for instance. So, yeah, so like you say, because you've not potentially had um, or encountered barriers per se, um, 
doesn't necessarily stop somebody from being autistic if we understand it isn't a negative thing inherently. And also, I mean, I think it's quite good to have Jeanne here. It's made me think that actually we are moving way away from that pathology model and the medical model of it being like this reductionist model of what autism is, like the triad. It's nowhere near there. We're seeing this more and more, you know. Um, so actually it's quite good having someone here that's kind of on the edge of it and it's not, you know, so kind of vivid or, or kind of as clear as with, with other autistic people. And it, yeah, and it's just, it's just an isolating way as well to think of it if you just think of it as you only get diagnosed when you're really, really struggling. Um, yeah, okay, so on to the actual topic at hand. Um, why is that? I really can't remember how we ended up on this. We really must have gone around the houses when we were chatting. There um, were two people with attention differences in the meeting. It was always going to happen, <laughs> wasn't it? Let's be we were jumping around. Um, so my first question that I had for us, with, which is what, I mean, it says your, but our. So what are our perspectives on the differences between neurodivergent and neurotypical relationships? That's quite broad, but mm. I guess what I'm asking and like I say, that doesn't have to be romantic relationships, but I think we must have, we, we were getting onto conversations about how, if we're in neurodivergent relationships, how they might work in comparison to if we happen to be in a neurotypical relationship, mm -hmm. i.e. the other person being neurotypical, or when, particularly when you're not knowing you're autistic, trying to manage a relationship as yeah. if you are neurotypical does that make sense yeah and that that's really different for me because that kind of like goes back to kind of this whole story around when I was identified and I was actually in a, a not very good relationship um so it was quite abusive in a way but then when I um and then I was literally at the doctors like oh my god I'm depressed but because I was kind of in that masking thing I was trying to fit this stereotype of what a standard relationship should be and then all of a sudden my children you know my child was identified as autistic and that kind of that kind of peeled back the layers for me as well um well regarding neurotypical relationships though and we I've been thinking about this since we last spoke I wonder if I've ever actually been in a neurotypical relationship or friendship because I just don't tend to connect with neurotypical people at all not at all even people who don't understand that they're neurodivergent we just seem to well it's double empathy isn't it mm. we're just drawn to each other so I've definitely been and had friendships and relationships with people that don't realize they're neurodivergent and that brings a whole other because because we're both trying to abide by the rules and it all gets very messy um but yeah I don't think I've probably ever had any close friendships or relationships with neurotypical people I wonder what the hell we would talk about I think that's quite interesting because I think I can say looking back I've clearly had now with the knowledge that I have now I've had relationships so we're talking about non-intimate here for a second mm -hmm. so kind of girlfriends if you like I've had um relationships with definitely with neurotypical successful neurotypical relationships you know now knowing that I'm neurodivergent and I've obviously also had I've evolved towards people who are neurodivergent and you know you know actually when I went through my diagnosis one of the big questions they were asking about was about relationships actually and actually I was kind of I was kind of defying the rule you know the rubric because I was saying actually I mean Jean will know because she's known me 20 years that I've actually got lots of friends and they are neurotypical. But when I think about what the quality is of what sustains those friendships, most of them are either living abroad, they're, they're, I manage them well, because I'm probably managing them in a, in a autistic neurodivergent way. Um, but, you know, when I would have to comment on maybe a more intimate relationship in closer proximity, that would be more, that would be di different. Um, but yeah, I think that the, the success of the neurotypical friendships that I've had have been because actually when I think about it, you know, the kind of the one on oneness of it. So probably quite when I think about it, all my really close neurotypical friends, I see them one on one on their own, not in a big group. They might they're usually uh, quite strong individuals doing their own thing so they're quite independent they may be living abroad or not you know it's not that kind of enmeshment you know and going out in groups um so i think neurodivergent 
pe people can have really successful relationships with neurotypical people, uh, as well as the flip side of that as well. Um, and I think I'm kind of similar, I guess, to Tanya then, which is when I look back, I think, I don't know that I've actually ever maintained any neuro like friendships or relationships with neurotypical people. So if I look back, I kind of go, yeah, you probably weren't neurotypical. Um, and so, yeah, I think I'm more likely to have had neurodivergent friends. And I think I can think about how we got onto this topic yesterday, which was maybe how I was asking who Jeanne was, or you were explaining who you were because we hadn't met before. Um, and you were saying, I can't remember if you, you described yourself as neurotypical or if Alice described you as neurotypical. And I was like, no. I know. I remember, because um, I think Alice had said that she'd been friends, really good friends with Jan for like 20 years. And That's we just right. went, bingo. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, I and think then probably making a joke about the fact that I was neurodivergent, you know, that I'd successfully maintained that for 20 years, her being very different to me. Yeah, I think it was that actually. Yeah. But I think what was really interesting is something that I think both Tanya and Alice said about you, Jan, which was that... Yeah. And because I, I was like, no, I'm not feeling the neurotypical here. And I'm getting like, you know, auty da or at least neurodivergent da. And Tanya and Alice both said that you don't make them feel anxious. So Tanya yeah. and Shan only also met yesterday. I think we met once before, before, but that was it. Okay. Yeah, even the first time we met, I just didn't feel anxious at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you actually described it as safe, didn't you? That you felt safe mm -hmm. with her? yeah and that's how i that's how i feel with jeanne as well um, yeah. it's interesting because alice and i were talking about this the other day that that all of my closest friends are probably the ones that i've stuck with the longest um are clearly neurodivergent if if not actually um diagnosed as such um i mean you know my my oldest friend is um very attention deficit in in the way he is um and and that's what works. I think that's 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 where I feel comfortable. That's the kind of relationship that I can, you know, I can sit, I can spend time, I can spend every day with him. You know, I could spend more time with him than I think a lot of neurotypical married couples could do. You know, you, you've got this thing about rising divorce rates during lockdown because people are actually having to spend time with each other, and it's like there's several people in my life who I can easily spend all day every day with and have done on occasion. And they're all very different to me and they're all kind of they similar very different mm. what it is actually about Jeanne um is it, i feel like she speaks my language our language you know that and very much how i felt when i was diagnosed and then i embraced my community mm -hmm. yeah and it was like all of that stress just went i didn't have to explain it myself i didn't have to excuse myself you know how you feel when uh, you know all that those cliches of you come home hate that cliche but do you know what i mean and it's like that with her and it's always been I feel like, like this that. is like a jean love fest i know <laughs> jean <laughs> as well, just... <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's, it's but it's but what we do what this is 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 it's what it symbolizes in terms of yeah those those relationships that that can exist yeah and the ingredients are and I think the anxiety thing, when I say that neurotypical people make me feel anxious, that's probably too simplistic. It's almost like you get that sense that you are going to have to do some real mental gymnastics mm -hmm. in order to be able to effectively communicate with this person. And there's always a chance that you're going to offend or move too fast or jump around. But I didn't get that from Janet at all. She just followed. <laughs> and I think, so this is quite interesting then. So, so we're kind of still on the topic of relationships here. But we are really what we're talking about is that communication difference mm -hmm. in relationships of any yeah. description. So I've been joking about how, you know, most I'm on Zoom nearly every day. The majority of people I have meetings with, consults with, do training with uh, actually. Let, OK, I guess less so the training. The training is often for non autistic people who want the training. Um, so but the majority of the conversations I will have with people they are neurodivergent so when I have a conversation or a meeting with a neurotypical person there is definitely a much more uncomfortable feeling mm -hmm. and it's not 
it's not like it's preemptive. It's literally, you, I just go into a, a meeting like, and you kind of, there's, yeah, there's just a very different quality to it, which is again, why we can't really pinpoint it, but saying that I've never met Jean before, but I didn't feel uncomfortable in that meeting. Whereas I go into a meeting with a neurotypical person I've never met before. And they do the thing of, um, they've literally never met me. So how are you or, or whatever? And I'm like, where are we going with, you know, this is weird small talk. And then I just do my awkward autistic thing, which is explaining the difficulty I have with small talk. That's my idea of small talk now, which is explaining <laughs> the difficulty with small talk. Um, and it's not even, it's, it's not their fault. It's none of that. But the conversation and the communication, it's just slightly qualitatively different. And sometimes it's very hard for us to put our finger on what it is. I have a question, Chloe. What about when autistics do small talk with you? Because this is a common con uh, misconception that autistics and, and you know, neurodivergent people don't do small talk. But I often ha ask my neurodivergent friends, how are you? And that's okay. So it's, it's because weird. Because you mean it. Yeah, definitely. It's a very, it is definitely different. I don't know why we can tell the difference between mm. somebody, so how are you or how have you been? If you have a neurotypical person asking you that, for some reason we can pick up on it's not genuine. Yes. Not, not that they're being, you know. No, they're just doing the dance. Yeah. Whereas I think if a neurodivergent person asks you how you are, you don't have to worry that you have to pretend that you're okay because yeah. I can't do that for one thing um or that if you do tell them the truth they're going to go oh wasn't expecting this much much honesty kind of thing you do it you do get a lot of honesty from autistic people and I'm just just thinking again about that communication thing so if it's all right to explain Tanya again I'd only met you yesterday yeah and you you weren't apologizing for the way you communicated but you were kind of trying to make sure that I was going to understand how you spoke was quite to the point. It was, uh, I don't know how you would describe yourself in terms of how you communicated. How I communicate. Um, I'm quite, the, so it, it's like we were talking about, I think in pictures a lot. So the time that it takes me to process and then dig words out quite often is it's sometimes quite, I don't feel like there are the words that I need to express what I can see or feel. So it, it can sometimes be quite internally frustrating. And I do have the, I'm trying not to, but I do quite often slip the odd swear word out there as well, because it just kind of adds weight to what I'm trying to say when I can't find the right word. So yeah, I'm always really aware of that. But I think thinking about it, that probably comes back from like some real, like years and years of anxiety around communication and being misunderstood or being told that you're aggressive or or whatever. So yeah, that's that's a me issue that I need to work through. But I suppose everything's the same. But with that, that's why I say what's interesting about that is like I say, I'm glad you weren't apologizing for your mode, mode of communication because no. there's never a need for that, um, unless the person's actually trying to be offensive. <laughs> um so yeah, for me it was just very direct, it was knowledgeable, it was boom, boom, boom. I know this stuff, I know this stuff. And to me, because I'm I I don't even have to know you're neurodivergent. I kind of know you're neurodivergent anyway from that mode of communication. But my point being that I just took it as it as it stood, if that makes sense. Mm. Whereas I can see not just yourself, there's going to, you know, I've met lots of other autistic people who some have very quite monotone way of speaking. There's no negative connotation for me putting saying mm. monotone, that's just statement. Um, so be quite monotone. Um, have been told by non-autistic people they come across as aggressive or hostile and I don't see that and I don't feel that no. and it's it's very difficult to try and explain how that communication how we understand that it's not aggression or hostility it's kind of an information exchange isn't it it's the most for, so for me when I'm communicating because of my intention differences which affects my memory quite severely or you know or because I've got a lot of other stuff going on when when somebody asks me to deliver some information I'm thinking bam 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 I need to follow the script get it out as quick as possible deliver what I want do it in short st short sharp um, bursts so they can then pick up what additional information that they want it's kind of everything that I do especially around communication is managing energy levels 
because it is quite a, a laborious thing sometimes to have to communicate constantly. So literally everything that I do in my life is spoons management, every decision that I make, everything. And I think that's probably true of quite a lot of neurodivergent people as well. Okay, so let's try and get this into, okay. Where I think it's going? interesting when you think about, so, you know, when you're, when you're talking to someone who you understand thinks the same way you do, and therefore they're communicating in the same way that you do, it does make it easier. Um, and I think when we're talking about, you know, if, if you're neurodivergent and you're with someone who's neurotypical, who's, who's living and communicating by a, a whole sort of predetermined set of rules that, you know, you're having to sort of second guess a little bit, you know, is, is this what they actually think or is this what we're supposed to say at this point? Um, I had, you know, one of my early relationships was was with a very neurotypical guy, actually, and um, it went on for years, and it ended, and I realised that I was free <laughs> at the end of that because because it had been like, well, we were doing what we were supposed to do yes. rather than necessarily what we felt we wanted to do, mm -hmm. and and it was actually me saying, do you know what, actually, I want to do this, and he was like, well, no, you know, we're we're supposed to buy a house now. That's what he wanted to do. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> that's not what I'm doing um yeah so which those doesn't expectations it's the, which, exactly it and, and there's what a sort of relationship should look like mm -hmm. and it's it's the sort of honesty you know it's, it's almost easier to build trust because you're not kind of do they mean this or do they mean that you know it's it's it it feels more straightforward I think yeah for me before <laughs> before I was identified and before I was even like even in friendships, whether it was colleague relationships, uh, romantic relationships, whatever it was, it was constantly following the narrative. I mean, even down to romantic relationships, okay, um, I find this person, it was a very logical decision. Um, I should be doing this. This looks about right. We should be doing this now. Oh, children. Yes, no, we should be doing that because we've been together so many years and then we should, and it, yeah, but now it, it's totally not. So since, um, leaving my last relationship, if you like, which wasn't very good. And I was kind of just discovered towards the end of that. And I think that's kind of what ended the relationship. I've just stayed single. Um, well, I say single, um, single in the neuronormative way, I think, <laughs> if that's even a thing, because I think that um, the stereotypical relationship for me, now I've like learned an awful lot about myself, especially, and I'm speaking specifically about romantic relationships, are very codependent, aren't they? Maybe that's just my view of it. Mm. But there's this kind of idea that one and one makes one, mm. and that you, you should be looking to find everything that you could possibly need to complete you in one person. And to me, this, that just smacks of being really unhealthy and a little bit codependent. Yeah. Um, just to pick up, um, I thought it was really interesting what Jeanne was saying. Mm -hmm. I think what we're talking about is, you know, that concept, you know, authenticity. So you mm -hmm. said, actually, when he went, you could be free and you went like that, you know, and it's yeah. mm -hmm. authentic. And it's just, again, another kind of manifestation of what we know as masking, you know, having to put the mask on in a relationship. You mm -hmm. know, you could finally let the mask go, you know, and I think authenticity and authentic communication. Mm -hmm you know that's what you get in your community you know and that's that's the relief you get which I have yeah. felt since I've been diagnosed to be authentic to, to express who I am my soul in a way I, I you know and not be judged and um yeah so and yes picking up on what you're saying Tanya you know so for me I have lots of male friends I have lots of female friends but I choose to be sing you know at this point in my life I choose to be single um because it's you know the way I want to conduct my my life and my relationship is not in that neuronormative, in yeah, the neuronormative no, way yeah. and that doesn't mean I'm asexual it doesn't mean I don't like men or women or, or you know or I don't want to have intimate relationships but yeah um so I just yeah I just know that um now um after years and years of trying to fit in and trying to fit into the stereotype of what we should be especially as especially as women um that that's not for me at all <laughs> um and that codependency and I'm just very very independent and kind of like self-sufficient and I don't need to be responsible for somebody else's feelings or them responsible for mine at all 
I think, yeah, sorry. I do you think there's a sensory aspect to that because I think if I was honest and authentic, I manage my world, my life, you know, I like, yes, I choose mm -hmm. intellectually and authentically to be single at this moment. Yeah. So there is, and the sensory is always massively underlooked in whatever conversation we're having about neurodivergence or mm -hmm. uh, to be autistic. I think there's a sensory aspect of that, of, of, of having my shape and being, you know, not having that, that enmeshment, that codependency you're talking about that's an emotional state but it's a physical state it's a yeah yeah so I just yeah I think unless I mean, Jan had something you did you have a burning thing you wanted to say because I'm thinking I want to ask everybody then what do we feel is that idea of typical relationships so what okay there is te technically there is no such thing as neurotypical but we are talking we're talking about statistical typicality we're not talking about there is such a thing as normal but there is this ideal there's a neuronormative like you said um alice um ideal about relationships and the expectations and i want to pick up on that because we definitely talked about that yesterday which was mm. this issue <clears throat> of expecting everything stage. from one person and how unhealthy that actually is mm. so mm. any yeah. thoughts on yeah and, and your normal idea of a relationship oh yeah it's just the kind of idea that you're always going to be that same person as well and that you're going to grow and still be the same people together as and it's just it's just strange it's just like the most bizarre thing i mean didn't it come from like a uh, religion or something the idea that monogamy is kind of a thing I have to say, I've 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 lived in places where um, monogamy is not necessarily the thing, um, where you know people have multiple yeah. wives and so on. And um, I I I also struggle with the idea of how, how did this become the kind of normal expected thing? How you know? And I think even a lot of people that we would call neurotypical find that too restrictive, you know. And and oh. That's it occurred to me today, I was, I was watching, there was a little um, advert for a programme on TV, which is about teens dating. And it basically seems to be mocking any date or any of these teens that didn't behave in the like prescribed way. You know, this, this is how a date and the boy does this and the girl does that. And, and I was just like, oh, my God, no. They could... mm. <laughs> that makes me think of an anecdote, actually, because I... I'm like a serial monogamist. So I've had lots of long-term relationships. And, um, but that's just me in myself. I, I can only give my energy and spoons in, a, in, in an intimate relationship to one person, but not in the sense of that codependence. I'm incredibly mm. independent. So it's almost mm. like I'm that independent. So I've only got enough spoons and energy for one other person. And then I will not expect, because like I say it's so weird and problematic that we expect that our you know, romantic partner is our best friend, they're our nanny when we're sick, you know, they this, that, and the other. And I think that's not fair to any individual because that's, it's setting them up for failure. That's so much responsibility. And I think when I talk about monogamy, I don't mean that being in a one-on-one -on -one relationship is the bad thing. I think for me, what I struggle with is the demand of that expectation and that massive weight of responsibility that you are responsible for somebody else's happiness and, and vice versa. And that's just, it's not even possible. So where did, the, I blame Disney, um, but yeah, it, it's not even possible. I mean, if I met a person and just wanted to, and decided that I just wanted to have a relationship with them because that is what I wanted to do and that's what I felt like at that time, then that's absolutely fine. But it's that, I think monogamy is something that it should be given because you want to do that, not an expectation. Yeah. And it all comes to a demand, I think, for me, because okay. I'm quite demand avoidant. <laughs> But I think that's a really good point because, you know, if, if you are demand avoidant, then that's going to be, you know, that's going to really put a lot mm. of stress on you, you know, to have that. Kind of, and I think something that I was going to bring up maybe for later, Chloe, you might want to say for later, was uh, narcissist and autistic, something that came into my mind. And so I thought something that would be really interesting to discuss around narcissism and 
yeah, autistic women, people, and, and the kind of relationships, because it's just struck me. I wonder if anyone's actually done any research on that. Um, um, because yeah. before, through the neurotypical lens and the kind of psychodynamic paradigm, you know, there's a real correlation between, you know, high empathy, you know, empaths and um, not, not, you know, narcissistic people. And we know a lot of people uh, who are autistic are hyper, hyper empathetic. And I bet there's, yeah, but I want, it'd just be very interesting to see if anyone's actually done research on okay, that. Okay, I've made a note. I bet there's a big correlation. Yeah, we'll see, we'll, we'll think about coming back to that then. So I'm trying to think, so there was a couple of things, I'm going to lose them, I know I'm going to lose them, um, which is, like you say, that, what you said about um, the um, teenagers and the sort of list of how they're supposed to date, etc. And before knowing I was autistic, I always used to say, I'm not an interesting person, but potentially interesting things happen to me or something like that. I never consider myself particularly interesting, but for some reason, men did find me interesting and that I was different and so on and so forth before the hair as well, just when I had boring, normal hair. Um, and I'm thinking of things like the very short period of time that I was on Tinder because I say I, I haven't been single for particularly long periods of time. And I tried to Tinder and I just don't seem to do what, sorry, yeah, Tan is like, oh, why? Um, but it was like, mostly it was just out of interest. But, um, Morbid curiosity. <laughs> yeah. And it was like realising that I was so much more different in terms of my approach to the other women that these guys were like swiping with and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Because one of my, well, one, I wouldn't do the thing of waiting for them to message me first. You know, I don't need to do that. If I think you're interesting, then I'd quite like to find out more. Um, and my go-to thing, as opposed to just hello or whatever, because I'd get really bored with that, um, would be if you were placed into an inoperable blender as though you were the size of a lego person how would you get out and if they came back with something really interesting as a response of how they're going to get out of that inoperable blender if they're shrunk to the size of a lego person i would give them more of my time you know it was much yeah. more interesting than hello you look or nice. Fit. <laughs> yeah. yeah, or the inappropriate and highly illegal um, unsolicited dick pic and so on. Oh, yeah, exactly. I well, wasn't on Tinder before. Whoever days. teaches neurotypical men that this thing, this is attractive, it's not. Look oh. in the mirror, look down. It's not attractive. Who <laughs> <laughs> teaches them that? <laughs> so I uh, think, I, yeah, sorry, go on, Sam. No, I was going to say, I was, I was thinking about this earlier today, thinking about what we were going to discuss. And um, it sort of finally tweeted to me. So my my mum was a proper hippie. Yeah, the whole the whole free love caboodle. And she'd been married, divorced my dad, had several boyfriends and the gun at once. And then met a guy and settled down. And kind of showed me, this is what I grew up around. I grew up around lots of different kinds of relationships. And none of them was any better than all the she kept in touch with all of her old friends they were my uncle my uncle jack and my uncle mike throughout throughout my childhood and then i moved to brighton where anything goes um and i find that so much more relaxing than this idea of this is this is how we do it that i i don't understand why that's this coming back to this thing about why why this kind of you know, we meet and the boy buys dinner and this, that, and the, you know, those those steps, that kind of normal relationship, how how that became a thing, because the the diversity of different different interactions with different people, you know, I've had one night stands and enjoyed them. Um, I've had long term relationships and enjoyed those. I I haven't had multiple relationships because I just get confused. I don't know how people do that, but mm -hmm. you know, I've got nothing against it. Rock on. I just I just get confused. Um, I but yeah I find that so much that that's easier for me that that's you know I, I can relax into that and and I, I sort of feel the world would be a happier place if we didn't have these kind of the th this is the normal and everything else is is different it's like can we not just ultimately it any relationship whether it's platonic or romantic it should be about what you are as an individual prepared to accept or not accept 
Mm-hmm. And I'm the same again with relationships, whether they're platonic or romantic. I have a set in my head of things I'm willing to accept and things I'm not. You know, um, I know of it, it. I don't know if it's it's a neuronormative thing or a standard, but the this sort of weird thing, particularly when you see it on television and and films and stuff like that, of being really upset, for instance, if the partner watches porn as if they're cheating on you and things like that. It's, it's these sorts of strange yeah. mentalities that don't, and I just think that is not something I'm worrying about. You know, mm. are you good to me? Are we yeah. connecting? Are we um, able to support one another? But like you say, not in a codependent way. Yeah. And I think that comes back to kind of like the whole jealousy issue. I mean, I'm sure that there are a lot of autistic people that feel jealous and and all that kind of thing. But I can have like, you know, multiple relationships and and all the rest of it. And I don't get jealous or bothered because for me, it's more about connection. And every relationship that you have with a person, whether it be platonic or whether it be romantic, that connection is very different. So it's, it's more about that than, than this kind of idea. I mean, maybe even neurotypicals don't even buy it themselves. They're just so stuck in this game that, that that's what they keep doing because that's what they do. Well, divorce rates and cheating rates and things like that would indicate that it doesn't work. It's you know? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so why do we keep insisting that's what you know, we should so be it's, doing? It's almost, it's almost <laughs> like being neurotypical. It's like a religion you have to sign up to and follow the rules. It's a simple, which you know, it's it's almost like that. It's the same kind of script, the same dog, you know, the same dogma um, that that people can't that just puts pressure on people and they can't really adhere to anyway. It's yeah, um, but so then, you know what what we're saying is so far removed from that script. You know, I can see how from the other side of the coin how way off we seem to the neuro you know neuro, neurotypical certain neurotypical people and so now i'm thinking because we are all late discovered mm-hmm. if yes yeah, so that idea of have you been in a relationship where you potentially were masking and how that kind of went in that relationship and how your relationship goes now so i'm i'm going to if anyone wants to jump in but I'm think I'll come back to mine then so I'm thinking of my earlier relationships where I was described by my best friend at the time as a chameleon because I would look and dress and be into the same things as the partner was I was with and then the relationship that I have now which is a very neurodivergent relationship not without its pitfalls because we're very different neurodivergent but there's definitely differences and strengths to be yeah, neurodiver- yeah. in in, in um, similar neurotype um, relationships. Yeah, I think before I was discovered, all my relationships were, were based on what does this person want me to be? How can I support this person? I was always a supporting act. Um, so none of, you know, but I would literally drive everything into supporting them, whether it be in a work business, whatever capacity it was, I would, I would find myself dressing differently, behaving differently, um, definitely a chameleon as well. And that's really dangerous as well, because the more that you give somebody, the more that they want, and it means that you have no boundaries. And if you're not clear with your boundaries, it, it kind of, it gets very, not very nice, very quick. Um, and that always happened to me, but I now understand what, what that was, was me desperately trying to fit in and, and not feeling deserving or not feeling like, you know, I wasn't trying hard if something went wrong. And that kind of gives the other person that kind of belief as well. I don't know how that works, but it just does. Um, but yeah, since being identified neurodivergent, um, my relationships are very, very different. Um, you know, so I have... Um, relationships with multiple people would you call it uh what would you call it polyamory or whether it's like respectful Mm -hmm. non-monogamy or something I don't kind of like the word like I said with the words there's never really a word to describe it but it's based very much on friendship and connection first not what can we give each other it's kind of a a mutual respecty thing and respecting each other as individuals it does that Mm -hmm. even make sense (laughs) Yeah, it does. yeah well, it does because I, I quickly yesterday did say that although I was talking more about um, it's a TED talk by mm. uh, a sex therapist. Yeah, but I think it applies to all relationships, which is that as long as it's between consenting adults and there's no unwanted um, pain. 
anything goes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, so I think, yes, she was talking more specifically about sex and yeah. basically how anything goes as long as you're both consenting and there's no pain. But I think the same applies to relationships in general. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah, nothing is abnormal. Everything, as long as the person's, you know, it works for them. And it's kind of like love um, is, it's almost like that word is described for family members or for romantic relationships. And that's not the case. I think if you think of it on a more broader term, I, I love a lot of people. It doesn't necessarily mean I want to have romantic or sexual relationships with them. But, you know, I have an awful lot of love for Bobby or an awful lot of love for Kieran or Jess. Doesn't mean that I want to sleep with them or have a romantic relationship with them. But then, you know, so it's not it's not defined by those two pigeonholes that is neuronormative. I think it's more of a universal thing. Mm -hmm. It was interesting sort of hearing what you were saying about kind of when you were younger and I, I really resonate with that the idea that you were trying to fit in with the mm -hmm. person that you were with and you're trying to kind of adapt to them um I much to my own surprise as much as anybody else has got married five years ago um met a guy a couple of years before that and it's quite funny because you know he's older than me and we're both getting on um 50 coming soon and um there you go another, it was very another... Right, it's another indicator that you're neurodivergent because yeah. of the looking younger. We do all look younger typically oh, when we're actually. Um, but it it works and it has worked. And I think because because we are quite different, but we give each other the space to do that. Yes. And and pretty much the only rule we had was if this isn't fun anymore, just say so and we'll stop doing it. And you know. Yeah, yeah, he sits and watch football all day. I can't imagine anything more boring. You know, we, we are very different within that. We have times where it's more physical and other times where it isn't, times where we want to spend a lot of time together, other times where we don't see each other all day. And that's, that's good, actually, because we don't, I don't know, we don't all think in the same way, but that's okay. It's that acceptance of the fact that it's different. So... I guess when you're coming back to the kind of, does it have to be the same neurotype? No, I, I don't think people have to think the same way, but I think there has to be the space and the freedom within a relationship to be different. And, and over time, as well as kind of between each other. Mm. I don't know, does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, it does, no. make, it does make sense. And, sorry. No, I was just I was saying saying it does make sense in terms of we're not we're not this isn't a binary thing like oh only neurotypical people can be together only neurodivergent people can be together because in the neurodivergent community there's so much you know that we're all so different you know where you may be yeah. more demand avoidant or you may be this or you may be that um for me interestingly when I look reflect back on my relationships so you know if we have sort of types you know so Tanya you said you tended to lose your boundaries and kind of give, 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 and because you were masking. I was the opposite. I was unmasked. So I was this colourful thing, creature, around, you know, my boyfriends. With, and sometimes that really works. I thought I was this amazing, incredible, shiny, shiny thing. But sometimes it's too not too much. I don't want to use kind of negative connotations, but it's intense. So um, this is, I think, this is another part of, you know, what it is to be autistic as well. So you you kind of there's different kind of scripts we get kind of get into. But yeah, I I was very um, unmasked, and mm -hmm. that can be a beautiful thing, but it can be dangerous as well because you know in the in the arms of someone exploitative or an exploited, it can be you know, that can lead to all kinds of different pathways. But I, I was lucky, actually, that I was able, with certain guys that I was with, to, to be authentic. But that also wasn't, you know, I'm not with them now, so it wasn't sustainable. Um, going forward, since diagnosis, I feel like I just want to stop and, what you know, yeah. I come board, I, want, I just want to be on my own for a while, you know, because don't forget, it's only been a year, just over a year. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I have the chance now of really successful, sustainable, authentic relationships with, with whoever. But Do you both think 
slightly different for Jeanne because you're married. But do you, Tanya and Alice, both think that knowing that you're autistic has almost given you that permission to be single? Yes, because it means that actually all this stuff that I was doing that didn't feel right, whether it be certain jobs or whether it be relationships or friendships or whatever, there's a reason for it now. Mm. And actually, um, I'm not saying that like I'm that I'm going to be single and that's it. But everything I mean, even from it's the first time really in my life that I've ever actually done anything that's just for me rather than supporting somebody else um you know since being identified which is and it's all you know so I turned 30 which means I'm a grown-ass woman it, you know I was identified autistic I was single I had my kids so it was all those three kind of things together and so for the past like three and a half years I've just been doing my own thing and now I've got my own business that's thriving I you know my friends are all neurodivergent I fit in or I don't fit in I feel okay about not fitting in. I'm fitting in with other neurodivergent people who also don't fit in. So yeah, all that kind of stuff's really coincided. Um, and I'm not saying that I'm never going to, but the more I learn about myself as well, the more I think, how the hell is anybody else going to deal with this? <laughs> because it is, oh. we are very, we're, we're very complex, aren't we? We're very complex creatures. Yeah, but you know what, you, you know, I say this to, you know, kind of defensively to you because, but it's a beautiful thing. It's like a porcelain vase, you know, it's this multifaceted diamond, you know? So, um, yeah, um, you yeah. know, in answer to your question, Chloe, yes, yeah, so for me, so rather than having the, the kind of uh, neurotypical lens on of, oh, you know, I'm single and I'm not in relationships because I'm too much or I'm this or I'm that or I can't oh, no. actually getting, getting you know, your question and, you know, getting the diagnosis, it was very validating because it was like, oh, okay, actually, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm choosing to be single because of this, this and this part of my neurodivergence and actually it's quite sustaining mm -hmm. and, and yeah, it's, it's, it's a good thing. So, and I think more broadly, again, back to relationships on the whole, is realising that you don't have to keep apologising for your mode of communication or yeah. the things that you do, because a lot of people who are new to the community, for instance, still do that. And it's trying to get them to help break that down. You do not need to apologise here in this space. You are, as your authentic self, you don't need to apologise. So I'm thinking, so I was saying I was going to try and come back if I had time to do my sort of who I was as a neuro but the thing is I've always been different and weird which I like the word weird so that's fine um so I can't keep up that mask anyway but definitely the sorts of um expectations of a non-autistic person when you have your autistic mode of communication so I'm thinking of like being in restaurants with a partner I've been with for seven years I told from the get-go I've always known I didn't want children always and that's very difficult for people to accept um without me giving any reason you know I just don't want children um you know I told him from day one I never wanted children and he kept on with the relationship in the hopes I would change my mind mm. now that was really unfair because I was honest from day one the difficulties of you know being in a restaurant and all I'm interested in is psychology and that's all I'm talking about and being told I don't want to hear about this today mm. or I'm bored or, or you know I'm not interested or which means oh no you're not interested in me at all because that's all I'm interested in so I've got nothing left to talk about um and like I said or, or just ended up being interested in the same things or being made to feel guilty because you don't want to go to that party yeah. and you don't want to spend time with their friends not because you don't not because I didn't like their friends but because I just didn't want to do the thing you know so I'm thinking of the the change which is with my partner that I have now like I say it's not all roses there's there's always going to be clashes of neurodivergent types and profile but there's no getting upset with me if I don't want to do things because I'm he has attention differences so he's okay um, happier leaving the house than I am um, you know he doesn't tell me off that I meow songs a lot 
<laughs> or sing the same song over and over again because I'm stimming and I can't help it um, and it's just a need whereas in the past it's just you know you're singing the same song you've been singing this song for six months come on you know it's it's a bit much now um, you know it's these sorts of they sound like quite little things almost but really they're quite big things because that's really a, a huge part of who you are if you're stimming with words and that person can't stand you doing it, for instance. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah, definitely. I don't, I don't know. I think as well, um, I mean, I don't like just going back to what I think as well, like I've not even been discovered for all that long. I'm coming up to five years. So I think as well, that it's kind of like rebuilding your relationship with yourself as well. So because it's quite new to me, I'm quite enjoying this freedom that I've got and exploring it. And selfishly, I don't really want to share that. <laughs> yeah is that is that weird i don't know well of course it's weird it's us but you know but no, yeah. It's only, yeah it's only weird if you're on the other side of the coin you know that's, yeah that's not weird i mean i i get you and i hear you yeah i'm really discovering who i am and kind of giving myself permission to be all those that pe that person and and also i notice as well that every time i meet somebody else um who's neurotypical i end up having to explain why mm. i am the way I am and that's not apologetic from me it's because they can very clearly tell that I am very different mm -hmm. and I'm very open about being autistic and having attention differences and my children and my work because obviously that's that's my passion um so obviously the conversation always comes around to it anyway um but yeah I just get it's really tiring explaining who you are to people so I just don't bother I stay with the people that I know what about you, Alice? I've, uh, I've... Oh, Jean. Jean. Oh, yeah, no, I was just... Uh, I love the way you both use the word weird. Um, I've spent quite a lot of the last few years of my teaching career uh, oh. working with kids to reclaim weird. Um, weird is good. Oh, Different is great. Um, and I, especially I tend to do kind of lower secondary, so they're, they're just getting into the whole peer pressure, I can't look different thing. Um, not really sure where their place is, what do I have to do to fit in? Um, and I do a lot of work with them about the fact they don't have to fit in because mm. we're all different. Um, and so cur the curious instant of the dog in the nighttime is a, a novel I've done with them a couple of times, for example. And, you know, it's not unproblematic, but it is a great way of getting kids to understand that people, some people just, just see the world, understand the world and interact with it in a different way. Um, I always give it to them without any kind of introduction. They go, oh, this is weird. I'm like, yes, great, isn't it? And it's always been their favourite book mm. by the end of it. You know, well, they absolutely know. love it. And, and it's quite liberating to see kids. You know, it's like, OK, this is this is our weird space. We, we can do that here. It's fine. And yeah, I hope they I hope that stays with them. I hope they kind of don't I hope grow so up too. with those walls. Mm. Um, but so one of my favourite phrases that I use quite often is... Um, well, I talk about how humans are weird. So when you think about human beings, we are very weird. So the point is you find your group of weird mm. and then you're not weird anymore. Yeah, <laughs> yeah basically. Um, I just want to grab because there's four, I, I, I'm kind of glad we've gone off on different tangents because my questions, when I look back now, I'm kind of like, yeah, they're kind of boring. So I just want to pick up on a couple of things that people have said in the comments. There's been quite a few comments. There's also been Sai along with his um, lovely learners and they're sort of joking around with each other as they um, tend to do while they're listening. But there's some that I think might be quite nice to address. So somebody quite earlier on said, feel early on sorry said feeling discouraged is there any hope for a healthy loving relationship between someone who is autistic and, and a partner friend or parent who is neurodivergent but not autistic so define love define successful um it that depends on your definition of what you see as a successful relationship really um yeah i wouldn't know i don't have neurotypical parents but <laughs> you know <laughs> but yeah um i'm sure I don't think anybody is really neurotypical anyway, um, but I think for me, um, what's happened as I've learned more about myself is that rather than, rather than, you know, being single or being this or being that, it's just redefined how I look at connection, relationships, friendships and myself and where I fit into all that. So it depends what you mean by successful. 
I mean, and you know how I would answer that, you know, for, to the person that was feeling discouraged. I mean, yes, of course, you know, but, but the more we know us, you know, it's about the more you know yourself, the better that you know, and, and that might mean through diagnosis for some people, or through self-identifying or whatever. The more you, the more you know yourself, the more you'll be able to, you know, um, you know, choose people and situations and things that are going to be positive for you, and it, it, that may not be within a typical script of how a relationship might be so yes there is always hope but that's through knowledge of self really and what do you think Cher? I think you know if if you feel comfortable to be yourself with someone they, they don't necessarily have to be the same as you for that to happen and like I say my my husband is quite different from me um, but it works because he lets me be me and I let him be him and I don't have a go at him for the way he does things and he doesn't get annoyed by the fact that I wave my arms around all the time when I'm talking or you know, or whatever it is. I think that's the basis of any healthy relationship is, is both of you being able to be yourselves. And I don't think you have to be the same Except for that to happen. Mm. Um, and like I said, I'm yeah. very, very different to Louis. You know, um, one of my things that I say often about realizing I was autistic is it was a it was a surprise to myself it was self-discovery nobody told me I was autistic but it was a surprise to me um and part of that I always joke is because he's autistic and we're so different and it's like well yeah because he's also got attention differences he's six foot three with a beard you know he's very different to me um I've forgotten my whole point and this train of thought oh about being different yes you don't have to be Yes, the, I, I don't think it would actually work if we were completely the same in terms of our, our neurotype and how we experience the world. Um, I know Jessica, um, who, who's part of Academy uh, in the background. Um, I would like to get her on a bit more about talking about synesthesia because it's amazing. But she and her mum have come up with this idea that there's such a thing or such things as um, autistic people or, or neurodivergent people in general who are too close is like they they are too close so they're very um sense seeking and then you've got two fars who are very sense avoidant and so if you have two very um sense seeking people there's going to be clash there right and if you've got two sense avoidant well they're just never going to even be in the same room as each other <laughs> so yeah do you see, so whereas louis is in some respects dependent on the type of sense he's quite sense seeking and I'm quite sense avoidant. So there's like a balance, there can be a balance there. So, but there's also that mutual understanding that, for instance, I don't like being stroked or touched. It just makes me feel really, really uncomfortable. So if, if it's a, a platonic friendship, people know not to hug me um, and things like that. Whereas with Louis, it's me going to him for that um, cuddle or whatever so it's just those sorts of basic understandings of mm. that person's profile even if they're neurotypical you just need to understand that person's profile yeah and what Alice said before you need to understand your own as well um, yes. so yeah so self understand how can you can't explain to another person how to love you if you don't know yourself can you so that could be an, that yeah. comes on to another one of the comments actually I've got here so two seconds so if we go back to the person who was feeling discouraged mm -hmm. what I've actually asked is if Sai could tag um the group the social Sundays group that we run which is um specifically set up for people who are autistic and lonely and it's the most lovely group so that person that's feeling discouraged about healthy loving relationships what I would say is I think the really amazing relationships that I've had have been since realizing I was autistic and finding people who I can be authentically myself around and who accept that. So Annette Foster was one of the very, very first people. And I tell the little anecdote of me not having my diagnosis yet, not even sure if I was autistic because I don't look like my boyfriend's autistic, you know, um, going into the um, uh, university women's autistic group and just going I don't know if I'm autistic or not you know I don't seem to have um you know special interests I did it was psychology um but because you I was doing it as a degree you don't think 
of it in a sense. Are you expect it to be airplanes or trains or something random? I have, I have no idea what, you know, the problem with the stereotypes. But I did say, you know, I really struggle to make friends. I really struggle to, um, you know, I did have a friend, but I really struggled to connect with people um, who are new and that kind of thing. And just Annette in the corner going, I'll be your friend, because that's how all <laughs> autistic friendship can work. It's just that very honest, I need a friend. And it's not that neurotypical thing of, that's really sad like how are you talking yeah how are you so pathetic that you're talking about you haven't got friends you know that kind of thing it, it's it's more honest it's I need friends I'll be your friend let's give it a go yeah, yeah. More, it's authentic again it's that thing about authenticity again yeah and, and, it, I, and oh, sorry go on Oh, me. Okay. Do you know what I was? I've written down because I've got you know attention differences, so I have to keep notes, otherwise I forget things. What was um, really stood out to me, um, Chloe, is earlier on you were talking about um, Tinder and stuff for how you tried Tinder, and instead of the, using the word attractive, you used the word interesting. Yeah. Mm. So that was really that was really telling, and I think that is probably defines a lot of difference between neurodivergent and neurotypical relationships. Um, because that's what attracts me. So I have to find a person interesting in the way that they can teach me something or I can learn something from them because that, that's what I really enjoy before I, I, I build attraction. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I don't know if we can call this out because I would, you know, it doesn't sound very good and I'm going to say it, but I was, I was exactly the same. So most, sorry, I'm just going to talk straight. Most guys bore the fuck out of me. Yeah. Same. And I, <laughs> doesn't matter you know, how, doesn't, how yeah. good looking they are. I don't care well obviously you, you know or but somebody to really you know interest me intellectually stimulate me yes that that, that was and I, so it's interesting that you feel the same I wonder how how I you know that how common that is. how common is that people in in the uh comment section that would be really interesting to know um be because yeah. I, I actually had a thought earlier on and you've just reminded me of it and which is that um <laughs> not a lot of people but some people will have a type right that they have that they're attracted to even down to personality type it seems to be a type whereas if you looked at my um string it's not you know i don't it's not loads but then there's no um judgment whether how many people have relationships and how many relationships but if you look at the people i've dated or had relationships with they're so completely different from one another they don't look the same, different heights, different ethnicities, mm -hmm. different personalities. It's never been about that. Yeah, it's 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 more than that. It's not never been about the animal attraction. No. <laughs> but no, well, that important. comes after, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it, it is important. But yes, it comes up that secondary to and it's around inter interestingly if I kind of rewind myself, what I, what I would report to my friends is they need to make me think differently. So it's somebody that, yes, that kind challenge of evokes my breath, takes me to a, you know, so yeah, that would be really interesting to do a straw poll to see. Okay, so somebody very helpfully, that's Julia. Um, uh, so uh, sapiosexual, so loving. Um, that's it, sapi I saw, sapi yes, being sapiosexual. Because of your intellect, yeah. yeah. So loving okay, that's attraction <laughs> toward. That's us, Tanya. Mind. Yeah. yeah. But I like, I like being challenged. And this is probably yeah. another reason why I'm single, because when I'm approached by neurotypical people trying to do the neurotypical, you know, sexual peacocking, I find it offensive. I find it, yeah. I'm and like, I really? Also... Really? How many years? You're, what, 40 years old and you're still trying this crap? Yeah, I find it really offensive. I, 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 also I try wonder, something different. <laughs> do you know what? I also wonder whether it's that double empathy thing, but there's probably a different word for it, because we're giving off that vibe as well not that you know i wonder if certain autistic people are giving off that vibe not that they're superior and but they're giving off some vibe to to that, that also is just very subliminally that is kind of offsetting i don't want to say off putting but is putting a not a barrier i, I don't know what the word is but there's there's a dynamic that's going on as well there's, there's a two-way street so yeah so yeah, really. But like extra sensory perception, would you call it that? That we just can kind of give a, an aura or something I, like that? I don't know. There's, there's an unspoken language, and maybe this is for another live, but there's an unspoken set of stuff that is also going on very subtly. 
I don't know if it's, you know, psychological, psychodynamic, is it sensory, whatever, whatever telepath, whatever you want to call it, but there's something else that, that is definitely going on. It's an on. energy. It's definitely it's an energy. An energy. So, you know, that's like mono, monotropi monotropism again. I don't know whether it's there's something, there's something going on as well that you're, the, 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 so we have, we have the power as well. It's not just, you know, guys or women are coming to us. It's, there's something else going on as well. That we're um, acting, yeah. And, and I, I think it can have a happy ending. So I'd been single for about 10 years with my husband and was very happy um, doing my own thing, living my own life. I was loving it. Um, and we met on a dive boat. And uh, apparently uh, all, he thought, I'm interesting. Um, I love the fact that that's the first word that he thought. Um, and then he told a couple of people he was interested and they were like, oh, she's really scary though. She's really scary. Are you, are you sure you can do this? And um, and he could, and he stuck with it because I was interesting. And I was clearly, there was another girl who was kind of after him at the time, who, who's a good friend of mine. She's gorgeous, blonde, half my age, you know, all of that. And, um, and, and he went with me because I was interesting. Um, and like and I that, say, you know, from the start, I've been able to be me on that. And that, in which maybe I wouldn't have done if I'd met him. That in itself is ago, interesting you know. as well because, and, and somebody else, I can see the word intimidating because I've heard, I've been described as intimidating. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Been described as intimidating. Yeah. Um, and I'm just thinking, and I'm also thinking about my what my idea of you know talking to some. Well, I say the opposite sex, it obviously depends on who you are as an individual, but for me, the opposite sex in clubs and things when I was younger, and I think I mentioned oh. this yesterday as well to Tanya, which yeah. was, it might have been when we were all still there, which was that, um, I can remember being like 19 and some guy just trying some chat up line and I just looked at him and I went, can you just be honest and just say that you just, you know, you're just really like to sleep with me, I'd rather you just were honest and he just looked at me and went, oh, okay, yeah, I'd really like to sleep with you and I went, <laughs> Yeah, I'm not really that interested in you as a person, though. So, you know, but thanks for the honesty, because I just thought, let's just cut all this nonsense out. Yeah. Yeah. And then I can think, I remember another time being in um, a club and again, just some guy trying to chat me up. And I was just talking to him and I was, and, and Louis always describes it as um, my... Um, picking up on people's behavior and, and thought patterns and things like that. He's like, get out of my head, witch, because I'm quite good at recognizing what that person's likely to be thinking. Yeah. And I remember just chatting to this person and just going quite inappropriate. If I look back on it now and just saying, you've had quite a tough life, haven't you? And I can't remember what I was saying. I was just saying these things and he was like trying to be all cocksure. And then he was like, really, really like, annoyed and then stormed off and then I just turned to my friend and I went he's going to turn back again in about five seconds because I've interested him by being able to see him yeah disarm them can, can I that's and really, he did he turned really, around and came back again that's really key I've heard that in that what you're saying about being seen mm. I think there is a resonance there and this is part of what we there's something that you know this is a thing because I've heard that a lot with uh funny enough male non-romantic relationships more than romantic ones where I've had very good male friends and the reason I've had those is they felt seen they've had girlfriends or whatever that they've done whatever they but they're incredibly co close you know uh, safe male friendships but the, the, because they they have said that they felt seen and you know the word again maybe being authentic to be seen and to be you know to be yeah, that unconditional stuff as well. So there's there's obviously something, you know, that is obviously something common amongst autistic yeah. people. I've, I've been accused of that as well, Chloe. Like I just have this like uncanny ability to just see through people. Like you can watch their behaviours and the way they carry themselves and their post. I don't know what it is, but you can just see it. Whether you know they've recently had a break, or it, I don't know what it is, but you can just see straight through them. Well, it makes sense if we know that that there's a whole sensory system that yeah. we're being autistic, it makes sense, you know, in terms of extrasensory perception, you know, what we've previously described as extrasensory perception. So that, that makes sense. Well, we're pattern spotters that don't understand the people in the world around us. So it would not, for me, it's, it's a natural assumption that we would apply that to um, neurotypical behavior. 
I do anyway, all the time. But it's not like you're doing it consciously, though. No. It's not like we're being sneaky and no, being no, no, able to pull not. apart people's um, thought patterns or, or something like that. You just can't help but see that person. And it, like I say, it can be quite disarming, but it also interests that person. Yes, it does. Because you're not, and it's that horrible, cheesy cliche, and I would hate it if somebody used it for me. You're not like other girls or other <laughs> women, which is oh, yeah. be horrendous, but it doesn't stop it being true necessarily. But then you end up being their counsellor, don't you? And that's not attractive. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> okay, so because I want to move on to a couple of the other points that came up, and it kind of interlinks with what, um, you've we've sort of been saying and you've been saying so I made a note here about boundaries and knowing your needs because somebody asked or said that they've struggled with shame within yeah. relationships and situations due to not knowing what they want yeah. but knowing that what is happening doesn't feel authentic for them it's hard to know what you want when you still don't know who you are due to masking for so very long have you experienced this so the I obviously I want to get people's opinions but my two cents worth was that is really key is that understanding what your needs are because then you can either fulfill them largely yourself which is I, I would argue a bit healthier than like you say that codependence on other people but more importantly that then means you know how to put or what boundaries need to be put in place because we we're not going to get into detail about this I did have trigger warnings for potential things but you know we can be put in we can end up being victims because we don't know how what our needs are and how to put in boundaries you know the, the idea of typical teenage dating like you said on this um mm. documentary whatever it was um you know the expectation of having a kiss at the end of a date or something like that you know you don't have to do that just because it seems right in the movies or in society that that's just the norm you know it's learning what am I comfortable with and then putting those boundaries in um, and I think that does come down to learning who you are as an autistic person yeah definitely. There's, there's definitely a big issue of confidence um, which is you know it makes me think I wonder the fact that we're all not particularly young so you know we've had a lot of time <laughs> to think about ourselves and who we are and and make mistakes and realize no that wasn't what was what was not good about that okay let, let's not do that again <laughs> um you know I, I wish there were as a teacher it's one of the things that I try and kind of engender in my kids to think about themselves and and kind of build up that confidence to say I like that I don't like that I'm not sure about that um, rather than, oh, well, they're doing it, so I've got to do it. You know, peer pressure has a lot to answer for. And I, I find a lot of society is kind of like adults doing peer pressure. It's like, no, we don't need to do that. You can be yourself. Um, sitting and thinking about what you want isn't something we're particularly encouraged to do either. You know, who am I? What do I want? We often, sitting and just spending a bit of time doing that is is not something people do yeah i'm just thinking i'm actually this is really i'm actually going to pin um the boundaries video because actually that's quite an important one for people mm. to learn your needs and then learn yeah. your boundaries um is is so important to safeguard yourself and not even just safeguarding just having the sort of relationships you want what are you willing to mm. accept and what are you not i think is really important so let me just find that link I think if I was being honest, though, you know, you know, being newly diagnosed, I think I just kind of want to kind of call this out and say, I think, you know, I'd feel I, I, feel, I would feel safe within the autistic community around boundaries. And, you know, this is a massive kind of, I don't know, I don't know maybe this sounds really judgmental, but I, I feel like actually I'd feel more safe in the autistic community around boundaries for the sense that possibly they wouldn't be encroached upon because they would be understood if boundaries were slightly skewed. I mean, obviously the important thing is to know one's boundaries and to work on boundaries and to assert boundaries and space and whatever. But if you're in that process, you know, of learning around, you know, learning those or relearning those because you're newly diagnosed, I, yeah, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a gross kind of like judgment to say I'd feel safer in the autistic community, but, but I would um i think as well that you you're not 
if if you're newly discovered it feels really overwhelming and a little bit like an identity crisis now and you're going to have to really overthink every experience that you've ever had in your life and reframe it through a neurodivergent lens and then you know beat yourself up for putting yourself in situations that you may not have realized wasn't necessarily healthy at the time um but it's not like you are going to forever not know your needs just give it time and just be you know and focus on kind of like that relationship with yourself and learning your needs before you can even consider putting anybody else in there really i think I think just one little point from, like I say, I've pinned the boundaries video for people if anyone's interested in the comments section. Even just like, it sounds basic, but if you're uncomfortable, it's a boundary need. Yeah. You know, if it's something that seems like it should be harmless, like holding hands when you've just met somebody and it makes you uncomfortable, say whether no. that's because it's a social thing you don't understand it whether it's a sensory thing because you don't feel comfortable holding hands that is a boundary need you know um and so it's about being able to then explain that in a in, a, in an assertive um but relatively positive way because you know the person's unlikely or hopefully not trying to harm but yeah it's about putting those boundaries in place but there's a video we had um, a counsellor explaining it um, to us it was really good actually um, so hopefully that helped that person hopefully um, when it was about the boundary stuff um, and knowing your needs um, we've got can I ask when you meet new people to open do you openly tell them you're autistic so obviously Tanya, you, you kind of gave a bit on this. Um, and then they said, obviously not Bob on the corner shop. I do. I would tell Bob. Oh, yeah, everybody. Yeah. Um, <laughs> My optician when, the other day. <laughs> and when they are shocked, how do you handle that emotionally? Um, I can't remember what video. We did have a video where we did talk about disclosure. Uh, if it's easier to find our stuff on YouTube, because obviously the videos are just listed um, I, I, I'm kind of a little bit mischievous. I'm a little bit of a mischievous neurodivergent person. So I actually quite like the shock factor. And I love um, messing with people's stereotypes. And I, I like doing that. I don't, well, yeah, <laughs> I probably know why. But yeah, no, I actually like that. And again, um, I think it, it comes back to what me and Alice were saying about you know, we like people who can challenge us or are really passionate about something or can teach us something. So I really like doing that for other people as well and destroying stereotypes and things like that. It actually makes me a little bit happy on the inside. I, I, th I think it's I think that's really good in terms of like raising the profile on that. For me, I um, I make a judgment. In I suppose it's about your energy. You know, I think, is it going to be worth, make, you know, making this disclosure or not? Um, but you know, I certainly now, since it's being diagnosed more and more, yeah, I mean, it's part of, it's, it's my identity and who I am. So, so yeah. But, I, but in yeah. certain situations, I might, you know, think it's not gonna, you know, it's not gonna add anything to, to this conversation. Yeah, I, so, but even a year and a half down, some from my family don't know, some of my friends don't know. Oh and, and, you know, my employees, colleagues, don't, not because I'm hiding it, but it just, you know, I didn't announce it on Facebook. You know, it wasn't, yeah, it's so, yeah, it's a gradual thing. And what were you going to say, Shan? I'm just going to say, I think it was interesting the use of the word shocked. Because um, clearly, you know, if any of us met someone, we just go, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's just, you know, like saying I'm blonde. Um, you know, it tells us something about you. Great. But. There is, there is still a lot of lack of understanding or people seeing it as some kind of affliction or, you know, so I, I guess if people are still being shocked by it, then, then that's why we might want to be reticent about, about using those kind of words. Um, you know, as a teacher, I've worked with, with kids with all sorts of issues and having to sit down and talk to their parents and, you know, if it's basic as I think your kid is dyslexic, I know that I have to prepare the ground I have to say it in a certain way because they're going to be shocked still unfortunately even though we know so much about this now um so I can understand I, I, yeah I think you have to feel ready for it and and confident in that situation but and if I'm they just, do go 
you're able to follow it up with it's okay <laughs> yeah well I've just dis- yeah I've just tagged mm. the uh, I was also just putting the link the disclosing your autistic so we did have a, a discussion uh, however many weeks ago on disclosing your autistic and how to potentially respond if people don't respond in a positive way um, and things like that and sometimes it is about the delivery that if you yourself are in a comfortable place where you're okay with the fact that you're autistic you know that it's just who you are and you you know you've you've you're taking it on as your identity I think that because I always say that I never get you know I tell a lot of people I'm autistic um I think I've only had maybe two people who sort of questioned the fact that I'm autistic so I can't decide if that's because I just look in quotation marks very autistic or just because I don't give them that room to oh, I do refute it or to um challenge it or you know anything like that and I'm positive about it because it's I'm telling you because you need to understand a piece of information about how this next interaction is going to go because I need this accommodation or I need you to understand me in this way um but disclosure is an interesting one and yeah you, you're like you say people will do it for different reasons so Alice you're saying like some people know some people don't know um and then Tanya was saying like the shock factor and things like that for me sometimes it's actually about gauging that person's response and then thinking okay I don't know if I'm going to be able to communicate with you because if your response to me is negative derogatory or something along those lines it tells me quite a bit about your prejudice and bias now I might still keep going because I will want to tackle that prejudice and bias as a social psychologist but on a personal level I think that would be quite useful as a a gauge for people do I want to actually have conversations with this person and that that's another reason as well um well well I'll be honest I think most of the time it comes out um that because I don't I think genuinely I can be quite direct and quite loud and project this really confident which is not it just is the way that I communicate it doesn't mean anything and people can be quite did she just say that and I'm like oh yeah yeah um so yeah again yeah and I like to see the cogs ticking when they figure when you say oh yeah that's because I'm autistic and I like to sit back and just watch the cogs turn <laughs> engage the reactions um but yeah I mean my whole business is you know a big part of my business is we are openly um neurodivergent um so we can't really hide it and I think from my my and my children and then my discovering that we are neurodivergent my dad's figured it out my mum's figured it out my brother's figured it out even my grandma who's like really I don't even know how old she is she's like really old like nearly dead old it's like sitting there talking to me about what it is to be autistic. So it's quite nice. But I don't like wear it on a massive badge that goes in in ev- like in everybody's face, because if it's not relevant, it's not relevant. But it is very obvious that I'm quite would be described as full on, <laughs> I think. I'm quite, quite interesting. Them. Is this your idea of full on? Because I just see another autistic person with attention differences. It's It's just that. Yeah, you know, interesting. It, yeah, it's, it's interesting, actually, because I thought that about Tanya, the way that you think that, to me, you're just, you know, part of the, the gang, you know, so it doesn't, you don't stand out to me. But I think it's from a lifetime of having to have this over, we have, and I think the loudness as well, because I identify with that, is from the neurotypical life side, having to come in quick and fast before you get whacked by some criticism mm-hmm. or that you are too loud or you're interrupting or this, that and the other. I think, I think that's why, mm. you know, it is. Yeah, in this field, I'm not, I'm not loud or too much or any of those things, but these are things that I know that have been leveled at me from um, neurotypicals a lot. Um, but in, in neurodivergent spaces, I'm probably quite quiet. <laughs> so i'm just making a note because somebody was asking something so i'm just popping that note down um can't go on too much longer because uh, my chinese is here it's usually chinese when when i do a live because neither of us can be bothered this time of night um i'm gonna have to hop off pretty soon anyway because i've got a yeah. person that needs some love okay i'm gonna finish on this one then because i think this is quite a nice one and quite an interesting one so we've been all over the place and kind of relatively serious at different times and things like that 
Um, so this one is quite interesting. Um, they say, I know these aren't exactly literally, but we do need to talk about the phenomena of our feelings toward or relationships with not people, inanimate objects, animals, etc. cetera. Um, yes, lovely. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna ask people's opinions in a second, but I'm gonna start with a little anecdote. I like my anecdotes. So Annette and I did um, a lovely event last, literally just before the lockdown started last year. And so we talked about March and we had a lot of waiting for assessment, autistic children around seven years plus. And we were doing our event and we we're, you know, doing our activities with them, autistic friendly, obviously, and doing all these lovely things. And I was a little bit frustrated because the parent, there was a few parents that stayed in the room, which is absolutely fine because some of the children might not have been able to stay or felt comfortable with, if they didn't know us. But they were using the time to ask me, Annette, and my assistants that we had there supporting us with the activities questions. And I was like, this is supposed to be for the children. So that's my little, that's just a little bugbear. But something interesting came up, which was a couple of parents were asking Jess, who was assisting that day, with their child sat right there, seven-year-old, lovely, lovely um, boy. Um, oh, he, he does this thing, you know, we'll, we'll go to the shops and, you know, he'll pick up this toy and then he'll decide he doesn't really want to spend his money on that because he hasn't got much pocket money that week and he'll put it back and then he'll feel really bad and really guilty and sad that he's left it behind and it's all lonely and all this kind of thing. Um, isn't that weird because you know and then laughing but not in a, a, a real way I don't think because he doesn't show that kind of emotion toward me and looking at me and Jessica both autistic people as if this was the oddest thing we'd ever heard and we went no nope, makes complete sense objects you know toys things much more easy to understand and assign emotion to than quite complicated human beings and you know trying to explain to her he does care about you but you're much more complicated than those objects. Um, so yeah, and I, I totally, you know, me and Jessica were like, nope, do the same thing. You know, Steve mm -hmm. has thoughts and feelings and, you know, all these kinds of things. So yeah, how do people feel about that, that particular topic? Neurotypicals do that with cars anyway. <laughs> Every car has a name. That is true, yeah. <laughs> You know, it's not, it's not that odd. Um, it, it's not that, I don't, I can't even explain why we do it because we do. Um, I don't, yeah. I mean, Joshua's come, Joshua's got this teddy. My son's got this teddy that he's had since he's three. Compass, I called him Compass. Um, and yeah, he's got his own little personality. He wrestle, you know, I've got things that I've had for a very long time. And while I wouldn't say that I assign them a personality, it's more, it's more than a sentimental thing though, isn't it? It's weird. I can't, I really struggle with words for this. You're probably going to be better than me, uh, than me at this point. Isn't, isn't there some fancy word around the project, sorry, I'm using psychodynamic language, but not neurodivergent language, but projecting emotions and feelings onto inanimate, well, inanimate objects. Oh, no, or... Are you not thinking of anthropology? anthropomorphized but i think are you thinking of something a little bit more than that where you are actually feeling feelings as it were for that well i, I i'm not really sure what the question was and maybe i've misunderstood it but I, I i understood the question as the emotions one has for like animals yeah, so they and said, dolls um... and stuff because that's that's really really common in fact that was one of the questions i got asked in the assessment and they pointed to all of the dolls behind and said, you know, are they yours? Are they your daughters? And do you have emotions for them? And actually, I mean, you know, yeah, I, you know, I, I had, I experienced emotions, you know, I don't take them to bed with me or take them out with me, but um, I'm not sure if there's some big fancy word for it. You probably know, Chloe, but yeah, there, there, that's really, it's really, really common. Um, and I don't know whether it's, I, I don't think it's because, you know they're easier to love than human beings i i have emotions for people but i just it's, maybe it's just that wider range i don't know because i don't want yeah um you know maybe it's that extra range of emotionality again that that kind of spews every spews everywhere but yeah it is a thing and i just not... really yeah i just really like my things they yeah. seem 
peaceful and constant and always doing what they expect you expect them to be doing and yeah it's I can't I just can't even find words for it but it, it's just calm <laughs> what about you Jeanne is that a thing for you it's I was just thinking it's it's one of many things that we understand kids doing and we let you know small people have their relationships with their objects or even their invisible friends and and that's fine and just part of being a kid um but somehow we need to stop doing that when we grow up and and I think no why, why, not? why not I have um <laughs> I have my slippers this one's Donald mm. that one's Google um actually Chloe you know you're <laughs> popping up I, at the moment I, I love them actually, yeah that's true actually <laughs> you've got names for yeah yeah mm-hmm. well I was um, just thinking oh god sorry go on no I was just going to say that you know a lot of people say oh that's that's childish you know that's really silly and it's like no that that just feels yeah that's a whole other live in and of itself which is that we hold on to a lot of things that are classed as childish that's a whole other live that Mm. needs to be discussed which Mm. is that to reclaim this this infantilizing us yeah when we're not it's not this childishness per se and what's wrong with childlike things or activities and behaviors that's a whole other life yeah i mean that's just part of the pathology absolutely yeah yeah yeah. it seems to be quite common as well that we just have this love for things uh, that might have been and that we are childlike as well there's there's that as well yeah so it's like that whole childlike script is running through and it's just part of the pathology Mm. paradigm Somebody said about um, things, you know, things, objects, uh, um, you know, stuffed animals and animals themselves um, being like an extension of you as well. So it's like extending that love um, to others and other things. Um, And we'll we'll wrap up in a second, but I was just thinking it reminded me. So I worked for um, I never say the names, but I worked for um, a, a beauty and chemist. Uh, chain you can all guess what it is um from around the age of 17 until I basically got my PhD funding so when I was what 30 30 something anyway um so it was a long time I worked for them and I would do this thing where I would collect if children lost you know kept behind or left behind little toys little objects little blooming um McDonald's um whatever you got in the, the Happy Meals and things like that. Because I just didn't like the idea of them going in the bin. I just thought, no, that's horrible. Those poor little, oh, you know. And so I had, and everyone was used to me, um, you know, working um, with, they used to working with me, that I had a little drawer that was full of them. Mm. People knew not to touch that drawer. Or they would come and tell me they found me a new one that was to go in the drawer, right? And then I was really upset and angry because a new... Um, um dispenser threw them all out and people had tried to explain to her please don't touch those those are that's chloe's drawer and i had a little thing in there that even said please don't touch these kind of thing i don't know what i was going to do with them but i just didn't like the idea of them going in the bin it just made me very sad for them um so yeah so this kind of thing and i was a grown ass grown ass woman um people took me seriously um i wasn't um a manager or anything like that but I'd worked for so long that people would come to me about you know voters or or all that kind of thing so it wasn't like they just did it because they were like oh pat her on the head she likes her little toys they just took it as gospel so yes I was very cross that this person had thrown out my toys and then I could just imagine them in the bin like just abandoned did that did that did that not cause a meltdown that that oh I don't tend to melt down um, myself. I tend to shut down. Um, but no, I think she just got a scolding. Mm. Not a good scolding from me because, yeah, they shouldn't have touched my things. <laughs> so, I would have um, had yeah. at least a glower. <laughs> yes. Um, I feel agitated for you. <laughs> yeah, it was very frustrating. Um, so, yes, I, I'm, there's been lots of lovely comments um, and some lovely silly comments like there usually is as well amongst some of the lovely learners. Um, I, I know we probably haven't gotten um, around to everything, but I think I picked up the ones that seemed quite um, interesting or needing addressing. So thank you so much, lovely people. Pleasure.
um, you. and thank you everybody on Academy. I'm trying to think what we've got next. What have we got next? We have got next week. Oh, next week is um, very exciting. So that next week is um, female autism in quotation marks. Um, why Ooh. we're still Geeky missing autism. <laughs> Sorry, say that again, Tanit. Sneaky autism. Sneaky. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, because you do stuff with Kim Rose. Yeah. yeah. So next week is um, female autism, why, we're, why we are still missing autistic people by gendering autistic experience. And so I'm doing that with um, uh, Jody. is it, from uh, Autism with Love and Laura Kirby from Positive Autistic Support and Training. Brilliant. So thank you, everybody. Um, you guys stay on my Zoom. But um, thank you everyone on Academy and we will see you next week.